My name is Scott Hoard, and I am a missionary for the preborn babies of our nation. Five and a half years ago, I was asked a question from an African-American friend, uh, what are you going to do about racism as a pastor? And uh, I thought, uh, I told him, I said, I'll just share the gospel. And he said, that's not enough. And I was kind of perplexed by the question, angered by the question, gave it to God and I said, God, would you take this anger away and give me something in return? And he said, engage abortion. And uh, so that's where it started, but I had no idea about the connection it had to racism. So the reason I did it is because God brought it to me, he set it upon my heart. Uh, my heart was pricked by end abortion now. Uh, even before it was called end abortion now, y'all were, Apology of Church was uh, rescuing babies. And, uh, and that, that was a spark. I think another thing that sparked it was I was at a... Um, um, T4G conference, Together for the Gospel conference. There was about 9,000 pastors uh, worshiping together in Louisville at a big arena. We broke for lunch that day, and 9,000 pastors were walking through Louisville together. And I thought, wow, what an impact that this should make upon this city. And as I was in the middle of those 9,000 men, I looked over to the left, and there was a woman praying by herself outside of a building. And I was curious. And so I walked over to her and said, hey, why are you praying? She said, this is an abortion facility, and I'm praying to end abortion. And I watched 9,000 men walk by and not notice. And it really hit me that day. I was like, wow, that's our nation. That's the state of the church today, that pastors, the church isn't responding to it, but that one woman was being faithful. When I first started rescuing babies, I didn't really tell anybody what I was doing, and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know if I could have an impact. I didn't know that Tina that day would choose life, and like, well, this is great, but what do we do now? She has needs. I realized my wallet wasn't big enough to meet all these ladies' needs, and so I had to present it to my church, and the church received it pretty well, you know, a little shocked at first, uh, but then we realized that the church's budget wasn't big enough to meet all the needs of the rescues that we were getting. And so it went from one rescue to 10 rescue to 100 rescues. And so we realized, hey, we need to organize. This is a big church uh, thing that needs to be addressed. And so we organized Operation Saving Life. And we, uh, I got some faithful people together that had been standing with me that had passion for uh, this great injustice. Um, and we organized, and we organized Operation Saving Life. You just have to jump into it. I think I would advise everybody to come to Planned Parenthood and stand with us. You know, there's a lot of times you think, oh, we have to have a pre-meeting, we need to meet over here and talk about it. You can do that, but the reality of it is, is you just need to come down here and observe and pray and just immerse yourself into it. And I would say, come down for, uh, a month or two and just watch and observe and understand the rhythm of what happens here. There's a rhythm. There's things that happen here uh, consistently and understand those things. Understand how to engage, listen to the conversations, understand what you need to hear, see, and how you need to respond to the various situations. And you know, a lot of Christians are fearful to come here. At some point as a Christian, you just have to face the fear. The fear is not going to go away. You just have to face it. And once you face it, it'll eventually subside. It might not go all the way away, but it'll subside. And as Christians, we're called to do it. And so I would just encourage Christians to come down. You're equipped. You, you, you often think, I don't have enough. If you know the gospel, if you have hope in Jesus, you are equipped to be here and your voice matters. I mean, we can rely on science down here and science shows us that it's a child. Um, you can talk about the racist aspect, the component of this, and how it was founded upon racism, but the gospel is the most powerful thing down here. And, and most of the people that are walking in there just don't have hope. They don't have hope. And we're in the Bible Belt, where everybody knows something about Jesus, has heard something about the gospel, but nine out of 10 people can't com uh, 
convincingly, compellingly tell you what the gospel is and what it means to them. They can't tell you anything about uh, what the cross means and the significance of the cross. And when you bring the gospel down here, it's amazing to people that are even in churches, it's amazing to see the light go off. And so the gospel is the answer to darkness, and that light has to penetrate darkness. It has to. I think three things that uh, every person has to carry down here is humility, uh, love, uh, truth, uncompromised truth. We try to engage people with love and truth guided by the Holy Spirit, uh, and we're trying to get them to come to us. And so it's really relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're looking for the Holy Spirit to show you that one little thing that, uh, that you see that you can speak to. You know, as a lady drove in uh, a couple weeks ago, and as she was draw driving in, she was in the back of an Uber, and as she drove by me, the Uber driver, driver drove by me, she lifted her hands up, and she was like acting like she was reaching for what I had in my hand, like she wanted it, but the Uber driver didn't drive. I knew that he was gonna drive up to that door. I knew I had five seconds, 10 seconds to speak to her. Right when she got out, I spoke very, um, just poignant to her. I said, ma'am, come get what you want. Come get this, come get, and she came over to me and it led to a rescue. That was the Holy Spirit showing me just a simple thing in her that I knew that I could command her to come to me and she would come to me. And so humility's big. You have to look at the plank in your eye before you take the speck out of somebody else's eye. You have to come down here in love, but also you've got to know that not everybody needs a hug. And so you have to bring with that love truth, uncompromised truth, and you blend all that together and it just seems to work. I had uh, one where um, a young man, young lady uh, pulled in front of me and uh, they were sitting in their car and I was talking to them. They had cracked the window and uh, I knew if the window's down, I could present the gospel or hear the gospel. I began to present the gospel. Uh, the guy, uh, the boyfriend was on the passenger side. He got out of the car and he was a pretty intense guy, strong guy, tall, tall guy. And he just looked at me, no emotion. I was sitting there thinking, man, if he comes after me, I'm done. And uh, so we kind of looked at each other and I told him, I said, hey, I'm not here to shame. I'm here to, to love you and I want you to have truth. And uh, so he just kind of looked at me, went back down into the car, sat back down and uh, the window was still cracked. And I just began to continue to, uh, to give them the gospel. And I quoted Psalm 139. I said, that, guy, that child is formed in the womb. He's intricately wove together by the Lord. And there was a commotion in the car. And the car began to shake. I didn't know what was going on. I thought they were in an argument. And all of a sudden, the guy gets back out of the car again. And he looks at me. And I thought, oh, this is it. You know, he's going to come after me or something. And he begins to walk to me with no emotion. And he walks up and he gets right up to me. And he opens his arms and he grabs me and he hugs me. And he begins to cry, began to cry, and he said, uh, hey, when you quoted whatever it is you quoted that scripture, he said, we had never felt the baby move. But when you quoted whatever you quoted, the baby began to leap in her stomach and it drew out so much emotion, we started crying and we knew we didn't have to kill the baby. At that moment, the mom got out of the car and brought the gospel to us and brought the gospel to us. It was such a movement of the Holy Spirit. We all started crying, we're in a circle, and she proclaimed the gospel back to us, and that child lives today. She's, she's you know, investigating whether or not she should have the abortion. What would you tell her? I would tell her she is made in the image of God. She is made to love, to nurture, to protect, to live sacrificially for that child. And if she is a mother, if she's pregnant right now, you are the mother of a child and God designed you to be a mother of a living child. If you kill that child, you're still going to be a mother, but you're going to be the mother of a dead child and you don't want to live under the pain and the oppression of abortion. That pain is real, it is relentless, and it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. God's mercy is there. His grace is there. And it's always there. But the pain of abortion is always there as well. And you don't want to step into that. God created you. He gave you choice. Choice is awesome. We're for, for choice. But that choice either proves a love for God or a love for evil. So choose life. Let that baby live and the Lord will bless you.